Okay, so for this videotape, we're going to talk about one of the most famous philosophers who has ever lived. That is the philosopher named Socrates. Even though he himself did not write anything, Socrates, in his philosophy, we know about primarily through the, through the philosopher Plato, but we have a large body of work that we are confident um, that, that represents the, the philosophy of Socrates. Now, uh, before we get too much into that, though, I'd like to talk a little bit about Socrates and, and the context and with, within which he found himself in, the, um, in, in his day. Uh, Socrates lived in, the late, uh, he lived in Athens in the late 5th century BC. Uh, now, as I mentioned earlier, he never really wrote anything of his own. Uh, Socrates and the work of Socrates was, uh, was all, always recorded either by, mostly by Plato, but, but a, a couple of other of his contemporaries or people who would come after him as well, including um, Aristophanes, who, who was a critic of, uh, of Plato, or I'm sorry, of Socrates, who said that, um, who basically accused him of being a sophist and so forth. <clears throat> so... Even though he never wrote anything down directly, um, he, he did cause quite a stir in Athens during his lifetime. Now, uh, I mentioned the sophists, and let me explain who they were, and then we'll talk a little bit about what the relationship between the sophists and Socrates was. Uh, now, the sophists were a group of uh, philosophers, and they were, they were related to the philosophy of skepticism. Protagoras was a sophist, um, and, and many others. But, uh, but they, were, like, they were related to the, the, the skeptics, uh, which basically meant that they believed in relativism. Uh, relativism in, in the sense of morality, relativism in the sense of being able to uh, know truth absolutely. You see, the skeptics did not believe that you were ever justified in believing or being able to claim that you have certainty in knowledge. The skeptics always uh, held any sort of absolute truth claim uh, with, very, uh, with a very high degree of suspicion. Uh, many of them even would go so far to say that, uh, that objective truth cannot be known uh, in this kind of thing. And so they were always skeptical of, of truth claims. Now, because of this, the, uh, the, the sophists primarily tended to emphasize, instead of looking for truth in the universe, they tended to emphasize the ability to, to, uh, to explain yourself, the ability to speak well. Um, that, that study is known as rhetoric, and they were teachers of rhetoric. And so they would go around and they would, uh, they would ply their services and their trade by, by um, going to, most of the time, uh, many members of the aristocracy, um, and they would, they would, uh, they would say, "Hey, do you want to know how to influence people better? Do you know how to? Do you want to know how to express yourself better in, in this sort of thing? Persuade people, win, win friends, and influence people." And the, the the sophists made a name and a living for themselves, basically doing that, teaching people how to argue both sides of the argument. Because to them, it really didn't matter which one was true or which one was good. What mattered to them was being able to choose whichever size you choose, whichever side you choose rather, and then um, and then be able to argue the point and take it and, and influence people to your side. Uh, so they were very very much into debate and very much into argumentation logical argumentation and being able to uh, win, win the crowd to yourself. Now this, this particular skill was highly sought after in Socrates' day. And the reason for this is because, um, is because Athens was a democracy. Now they weren't a democracy like us. We, uh, the United States has some democratic elements to their system of government. But the, basically, the United States is, is what's known as a republic. It more closely re resembles the government of, of ancient Rome than it does um, ancient Athens. Uh, but what, what would happen is any, anyone who was a citizen of the state would be able to vote on any and every matter that the state decided to do. And so they would go and they would, they would, um, they would show up at the place where they would <clears throat> hear the case. And any, anyone who was a citizen would uh, would be welcomed there they would be given a white rock or a light colored rock or a pebble and a dark colored pebble and they would show up at this place and people would be arguing two sides of the case and so the one person would go and argue the second person would get up and argue and, and so on and when the argumentation was done 
then they would stand up and they would say, okay, if you are for this side of the argument, throw in the light colored pebble. If you are for this side of the argument, throw in the dark colored pebble. Um, and, and they would do that. They would collect the pebbles. They'd sort them out and count them out and decide which side won. And that's what carried the day. That was a true democracy. Any citizen of the, of the state would get a vote on any and everything. Um, and that was, that was the, gov- the system of government that was, was in place at the time of Socrates. Now, if that's the case, then you have to understand that, that the, the ability to argue your side of the case, no matter which side it was, was absolutely invaluable in order to try to get your agenda done in the state. And so people would pay these sophists lots and lots of money to teach them how to engage in rhetoric and, and influence the crowd. And so, the, so the, the, the people would get up and they would argue, they'd present their side, um, and, and if they were able to sway the crowd to their, their side, they would be able to get their job done or get their uh, agenda passed. Well, Socrates was in the middle of all of this, and that was the value, the, those were some of the values that were, were in their day. Um, but Socrates, in the middle of all of this, com- comes, and he is, a, he, is, he is not a sophist. You see, because Socrates believes that absolute truth is actually out there. He believes that truth is there and that truth can be known even though it's difficult to, to, to find it. It's difficult. He would agree with that readily. In fact, Socrates would go so far to say he would, he would absolutely argue with any, any sort of idea, anyone claiming that he had knowledge. Uh, in other words, um, Socrates, if, if they said, Socrates, uh, you're a pretty smart guy. You know what's going on. Socrates would be like, wait a second. I have never claimed that. I've never claimed to have knowledge in, in that kind of thing. But Socrates, the way that he would go about doing things is he would go about the town and he would engage people in discussions, philosophical discussions, and uh, basically help them to try and learn how to think for themselves. Now, because of this, over a period of time, Socrates built up a, a, a number of followers. Um, it, a lot of the followers were primarily among the, the youth, and they ranged anywhere from poor to rich to aristocracy to people who are influential uh, and this sort of thing. But, but he, had a pri- he, had a, he had a following that was, that was heavily lo- uh, loaded on the, um, among the young people of Athens, and not just like teenagers, but you know, people, young adults and things like that, people who are willing to consider new ideas, new approaches. Uh, he, he had a fairly, fairly sizable following among those people. Um, he, was, uh, he, he referred to himself, uh, Socrates did, <clears throat> excuse me, as the gadfly of Athens. The gadfly of Athens, and basically what he meant by that was um, he saw Athens as a great city and he loved his, his, his home city. However, uh, he did realize that many people in Athens were very, very slow um, to, to uh, rise to the task of intellectual engagement. They didn't really want to examine or think about things. They were just all too busy trying to get things done without ever asking the question, well, should this be done? Should I be doing this? Should I take this route? Or should I take that route or, or, or whatever? Um, so Socrates, uh, Socrates was saw his role, he compared the, the city of Athens to a giant horse. And it was his job as the gadfly of Athens to go and bite that horse on its butt so that the horse would be, uh, would, would be stirred to, li- to life instead of being slow and lazy. Um, and, and so that's, that's, how he, uh, that's how he refers to himself as. That's sort of what he sees his, uh, his role as in, in society. Now, um, one, once upon a time, uh, Socrates had a friend, <clears throat> excuse me, who, um, who went to talk to the oracle at Delphi. Uh, now, the oracle at Delphi was this kind of prophetic uh, person who people would go to from time to time. And they would go in there and they would pay their, pay their uh, honor, honorarium and, and so forth. And they would ask the oracle whatever question they wanted to ask. And the oral, oracle was one who was there to try to tell the future or try to give an answer to the questions that the people had. So, uh, so Socrates' friend goes to the oracle at Delphi and he, he asks the oracle, um, is, anyone, is, is, is Socrates the wisest man in all of Athens? 
th that's the question that he asked. Now, the thing you got to understand about the oracle is that they, the oracle tended to give sort of cryptic answers. Um, they were cryptic answers. Sometimes they were straightforward, but they had a hidden meaning. Other times they, they hinted towards something that sent the person on a quest, eventually that brings about the fulfillment of the prophecy. We saw that in Oedipus Rex. Um, and so, uh, so uh, the, the oracle never really gives a straightforward answer. You've got to understand that. So uh, Socrates' friend goes and he says, hey, uh, is Socrates the wisest man in all of Athens? And the oracle answers, there is no one wiser than he. Um, and so Socrates' friend, you know, beats it back to Socrates. He says, hey, guess what, Socrates? I got some good news for you. He says, I went to, to the oracle at Delphi and I asked them the question, is anyone in Athens wiser than Socrates? And the oracle told me that no one was wiser than you, so you're the smartest guy around here. And Socrates is like, wait a second, wait a second, no one wiser than me, really? Um, and he says, I know that can't possibly be true because I don't really know anything. I, and that was Socrates' mindset. I really don't know anything. And uh, so he said, surely this can't be true. And so he sets out on a quest to understand, uh, try to find somebody who's wiser than he is. He says, this ought to be pretty easy, right? And so he, he decides, okay, well, where should I go first? Well, <clears throat> he says, I'm going to go to... I'm going to go to the, the aristocrats, the people who are, who are very influential in society, the people uh, who are responsible for, um, you know, governing and, and this kind of thing. So, so he says, I'm going to go to them because clearly they have to be wise people to be able to govern this great city and be able to implement the, the uh, decisions that, that people make about the city and, and this sort of thing. And so he goes to, to many of them. And there's lots of them, right? And of course, at first, he's welcomed into their homes and they, they, they've heard of Socrates and they kind of consider it an honor to have him in the house and this kind of thing, I can imagine. Um, and so uh, he goes to their house and he begins to talk with them and he begins to ask them certain questions. And he begins to realize, you know, these, these people are regarded as having a source of wisdom, but they're really not that wise. They're really not that smart. He found out what probably a lot of us would find out by watching C-SPAN. You know, these are the people who are governing our nation. <laughs> he, uh, he, he, he's just kind of astounded that they, they have these sort of blinders on toward many other realms, you know, when they're uh, of society, when, when they're giving their spiel and they're, they're on their message, they're just not actually making a lot of sense and and so he begins to ask questions of them and he begins to sort of cross-examine them and they find this to be sort of uncomfortable because they're not used to really being challenged they're used to being uh, they're used to being the ones who declare their message and not really having any pushback but Socrates is giving them some pushback and at the end of the day he's examining them and he, he questions them sort of into a corner where it's manifestly evident that they aren't really wise they don't have wisdom they claim that they have wisdom and they think that they have wisdom but they really don't um, and Socrates lets them know that he says you know I came here looking for someone who is wiser than me but I haven't found that you know anything and he says, I thought it would be easy because I, I know that I don't know anything, but, but you, you seem to think you know something, but you really don't know how things work. And you can imagine that that sort of project of Socrates probably didn't win him a lot of friends. He's going around to the various influencers in society, and he's, he's, he's at the end of the day saying, look, you, you, I thought you were wise. You're really not that wise, you know. So he doesn't win too many friends among the, the, the aristocrats. In fact, a lot of them become his enemies as a result of this. But he leaves off and he's like, well, he comes away from that part of his, uh, his, his critique. And he says, well, the, the, the aristocrats, the leaders and the influencers in society, they really didn't know anything. They, they, ha they don't really have wisdom. Maybe if I'm going to find somebody who's wiser than I am, maybe I can do it if I go to the artists, you know, the poets, the songwriters. Uh, the people who create these wonderful pieces of visual art. Uh, clearly, when someone looks at their work or listens to their poems or hears their songs, there is a wisdom that is there that, uh, that really cuts to the heart and cuts to the soul. So I'm going to go to them. And so he starts doing that. He starts going to the artists, many of whom are very well known. 
um, people who are responsible for creating uh, poems and uh, that, that are that are recited throughout the the, the city and songs that are sung at v various times of the year and so forth. So he does that, and he begins to realize the same sort of thing that he realized with the aristocrats. He begins to see that th with a bit of a difference. He begins to see first of all that really the 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 artist really doesn't know. Doesn't have knowledge of the topic that they they claim to have knowledge on. Uh, he begins to see that they have a certain kind of wisdom that is re that, that is more or less uh, the wisdom of inspiration. Now to to talk about what that means, um, if you were there listening to some of the old, uh, if you were in ancient Greece and listening to some of the poems in a in a um, an arena or something like that. Usually before the poet w was to go about reciting the poem, they would offer up a, a, a supplication. They would ask the, the muse, who is kind of the god or the goddess of, the, um, of, of those who are artists, and they would invoke the muse. And basically the idea or the hope was that the muse, who is overseeing all the art, would, would, would sort of take over their body and speak through them. And Socrates says, you know, the, the kind of wisdom that the artist possesses is kind of a wisdom of inspiration. It's like they, they're, they're writing this song or this poem, and, and for that flash of a moment, they, they have this, this flash of wisdom, this flash of intelligence, and they write it down, and then it's gone. You know, so after that, they go back to really not knowing anything about reality. And so, so he concludes, that, you know, that they, even though they have that inspiration, they don't actually possess wisdom. And, and so they're, they're no better than I am. And so then he decides, well, I, I'll go to one last group of people. I'll go to those who are what we might call the producers in society, the people in society who are responsible for, for plying a trade, you know, whether it's farming or shoemaking or sandal making, whatever the case may be, maybe uh, textiles, um, this kind of stuff. So he starts going to those people and he says, surely, you know, these people actually have to work in the world and make a living. And so, uh, so then obviously they're going to have some sort of wisdom. And so he does this. Um, but he soon finds out that, um, that while there is a certain kind of wisdom related to their trade, it is very specific. And their knowledge is a, is a technical kind of knowledge. In other words, th they aren't people who are, who are um, doing philosophy. They're not people who are searching after ultimate truth. They're not people who are... Uh, even asking the, those kinds of questions. They may have a knowledge on how to better or for better or for worse um, compete in their trade, but that's a very, real, a very narrow realm of knowledge that really doesn't get at truth in the ultimate sense at all. And so he's disappointed there as well. And he comes away from, the, from that and he's, he's thinking, well, you know, the, the, the oracle says no one's wiser than I am. However, I know that I don't know anything, um, but as I've, and so, so as I've looked out um, among the various groups of people in society, they don't seem to know anything either. But then it strikes him. He says, okay, I think I know the answer to what the oracle was saying. You see, because while everybody here doesn't know anything and I don't know anything, in that, in that sense, we're equal. However, the difference between us is that everybody out there doesn't know anything, and yet thinks that they do. They think that they know something about the world in various arenas. But I know that I don't know anything. And so the difference is, <clears throat> I know that I don't know anything, whereas everybody else has, has this assumption of knowledge. They think that they've arrived at a conclusion that is at, with absolute certainty. Um, and so Socrates thinks to himself, that must be it. That must be, the, the, that must be the issue. It must be the fact that I know that I don't know, whereas everybody else thinks that they know. And if you think about that sentiment, and this is one that in our modern day is very much emphasized uh, from, for, from Socrates. Um, if you think about that, which, which person um, is it easier to teach? Someone who thinks that they know everything or someone who realizes that they don't know and is eager to learn. Well, clearly the person who realizes that they don't know, that's the person who's going to be more 
more ready to investigate an issue or more ready to <clears throat> hear what you have to say on a matter. Somebody who doesn't already think that they have the answer, that's the person that is going to be more able to learn new information. Um, and so that, that's where Socrates believes that one of the first things that we need to do in, in, our, in our seeking after truth is come to a real conviction that we don't already have the truth, that we should, we, or the truth that we do have, we should be willing to hold with an open hand so that when new information comes in, we can either modify our hypothesis, if you will, to put it in sort of modern terms, or we can reject our hypothesis outright in favor of one that makes more sense. So, uh, so Socrates believes that the, the, one of the most important things to gaining knowledge and being, being good at philosophy and doing philosophy well is, uh, is to be humble enough to admit that you don't have all the answers and be ready to, to learn whatever new answers might come in. So uh, to examine them and then you know, either accept them or reject them, what, whatever the case may be. Uh, so that's, that, that's Socrates. Uh, that's, that's his beginning point, if you will. Now, uh, one, of the, one of the more important things that we do learn from Socrates is what, is, what has been known as the Socratic method. And the, so the Socratic method is a system of argumentation that Socrates is famous for, um, and it involves utilizing this basic principle that we just spoke about, the idea that until you're, until you're uh, humble enough to admit that you don't know, then you're never going to learn. So he employs that principle, and here's how he does it. Socrates is famous, and we see this throughout the, uh, the Platonic Dialogues, all of the writings that Plato did uh, that, that include Socrates. Uh, we see this, he's famous for sort of being the, the, the person who um, is always trying to get at philosophy, always trying to get at the deeper meaning of, of, of essential terms and, and this kind of thing. And every time we see him, we see him questioning people, asking questions. What do you believe about this? What do you believe about that? Could you please explain? Could you clarify? And, and, and all this kind of thing. Um, the Socratic method is, it heavily employs a questioning uh, pos uh, disposition. He's going to utilize questions uh, to both show people where they are wrong and inconsistent in their beliefs, and also to use questions to try to arrive at a positive statement of truth. Uh, so that's, that's his method. Now, let me, let me explain how this works then. Uh, he begins by just in the course of everyday life and conversation, he begins by trying to, um, uh, trying to distill and unpack uh, the meaning of, of, of essential concepts. For example, in Plato's Republic, we see a, a picture of Socrates who is at a wedding feast. And he's like, he's the, he's the guy at the party that just totally kills it, right? So he's at this wedding feast, and he and a group of guys are all standing around, and, 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 and somebody brings up the concept of justice and, uh, or of being fair. And Socrates say, says, oh, we're talking about fairness, we're talking about justice. Uh, what is justice? You know, he's got this, this term that he just pulls out of the air, it, you know, distills it from the conversation. And he says, okay, what, what, is, uh, what, is this, what does this mean? What does justice mean? And of course, he's at a party, right? You think you would go, okay, Socrates, can we just dance? Can we just listen to the music? Can we just, uh, can we just have a good time and congratulate the, the, the married couple on their, on their marriage? No, Socrates has to... Uh, has to uh, even do philosophy at the at the wedding feast, right? So, so anyway, he says, "What is justice?" He isolates this term in order to analyze it, and then uh, it, it, he says, "I don't know what justice means. Um, perhaps some of you could help me in, in in seeking after what the meaning of justice is." And so, he begins to ask that to the people with whom he's speaking, and uh, so one of them volunteers a definition. Well, justice is just simply fairness, right? Um, the, that uh, the, Socrates is okay. I didn't know what justice is, and it seems that justice could could mean f uh, fairness. You know, people giving to people what they deserve and this kind of thing. And he says, but and then he starts to cross-examine and 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 ask questions about the concept that has just been defined. So the person proposes a definition, and Socrates goes on and he says, that sounds good except this, or that sounds good except that. 
And he begins to show that there are weaknesses in that definition. And he begins to pull it apart, tear it down. And before you know it, the whole crowd's like, yeah, justice really doesn't mean that, does it? I, I thought that too, but you're right. You know, that doesn't really mean it. And so then, then uh, another person will propose a definition. And Socrates will say, okay, that sounds good, except for, and he will analyze that one, and he'll tear it down, and, uh, and, and then that, that one will get rejected. And this process goes on and on and on and on, either with an individual or with a crowd of people, until all of a sudden everybody just realizes, they're scratching their head, they realize that we really don't know what we're talking about. And uh, that, that's the whole point of this first phase of the Socratic method. It's to try to break down these definitions and these, these preconceived notions and demonstrate the weakness of them so that then we can all admit that we're in the same boat together. We're all equally ignorant of what this means, right? So that's sort of the first phase of, uh, of, of unpacking this philosophical issue. Socrates asks questions and utilizes questions in order to help people recognize their ignorance on the issue. Remember, it's not until we admit that we're ignorant that we start looking for knowledge. And so that, that's, that, that is what Socrates drives people to do, uh, to realize and then confess their own ignorance. And so Socrates does this until everybody is just sort of scratching their heads. Oh, we don't know what's going on. Ah, we have no idea. And then what he would do is he would utilize that same question and answer method to start, uh, to start rebuilding and in, in investigating and discovering what is, what is actually the truth about this philosophical question that we're going to unpack. And you would get at the end of the dialogue and finally he would have this whole scenario painted for us uh, about what, that, what a full-fledged answer, uh, full-fledged understanding of that concept might mean. Uh, so that's what Socrates does. That's the Socratic method. Uh, utilizing questions to break, uh, to, to demonstrate people to people that they are ignorant of the issue, and then utilizing questions to, to rebuild the answer and state it in a positive way. That's what he was famous for. Um, and there were many people who appreciated this, many people who liked it, and then there were many people who got sort of annoyed and angry at Socrates for doing these things. Uh, but that's what he would do. And he would walk around Athens and do that all the time. And like I said, he had a following of people who just liked to watch, who liked to learn, who liked to uh, critique and question and, and that kind of thing. Uh, but that was Socrates' method. All right, a couple of other uh, important teachings that were related to Socrates. Um, and, you know, uh, I will say this sort of at the, at the, at the outright here. Um, it's hard to, dis to really discern... Because Socrates is, uh, Socrates is found and presented in Plato's uh, dialogues. It's hard sometimes to discern what teachings or what beliefs actually relate to Socrates and what teachings and what beliefs represent beliefs of Plato that Plato presents through the mouth of Socrates as, you, as he's writing this dialogue in this narrative. Um, but, uh, but different stages of Plato can be related, like his early stage, can probably be mostly attributed to, to uh, Socrates. His later stage is probably more attributable to himself. Uh, but uh, a few other teachings that are probably also Socrates, or at least the, the initial nugget of truth, if you will, began with Socrates, are these. Uh, certainly, uh, Socrates believed that the most important task in life is to care for the soul. Uh, the most important task in life, the most important job that a person will do is care for their soul. Now, um, please understand that, um, that the, the Greek understanding of what the soul is is somewhat different than sort of the, the Western Judeo-Christian conception of, of, uh, of what the soul is. Uh, to the Greeks, the body was bad. Matter is evil. Matter is bad. And so the body, which is composed of matter, then would be something, they, they sort of conceived it as a prison, if you will, for the soul. And, and, and the body was something that is not a good thing. Um, but, the, but the spirit, the soul, is the, the non-material part of ourselves. That's good. And that's, that's 
the, the soul is what we should be building up. And so that is why Socrates believed that the most important task in life is to care for the soul. Because one day this body is going to break down and rot away, be burned up, whatever the case may be. Uh, whereas the soul is going to go on forever. It's going to, it's going to leave this body one day and then go on to the, to the next life. Um, so that was, uh, that, that's in contrast. I mean, the Judeo-Christian view is that the soul eventually gets reunited with the body and that the body is not a bad thing. Uh, but, the, but the Greeks wholly believe that, that, that the body is, is bad, it's going to burn up, it's going to rot away, and we'll just be rid of it. It'll be, the, we'll, it'll be like getting out of jail. Our spirit will be able to go forth and, and do things uninhibited by, by these physical restraints and physical urges that we have. Um, so, uh, so Socrates believed that a person, even in this life, should be about caring for the soul. Now, how do you care for the soul? What's, uh, what, what's that all about? Well, for Socrates... The, the, ability, the necessity of caring for the soul or the process by which you care for the soul is, uh, is, 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 de- is related to philosophy. It's related to a searching out of truth and wisdom and beauty, developing one's mind and developing one's virtues. Uh, that was what, uh, that's what Socrates would have, would have said. Uh, because if we go around chasing the fulfillment of our physical impulses, then we're going to be, I mean, that's, that, that really isn't going to help the soul at all. We're, we're actually going to be corrupting the soul in that we are bending the soul, the will, the intellect, the wisdom. We're bending them towards service of, a, of an evil thing, our body, you know, our physical impulses. So Socrates believes that, that we should spend our time and our efforts, our energy, caring for the soul. And he exemplified this in his life. He didn't spend a whole lot of time uh, seeking for wealth and power and notoriety. Uh, he was married. He did have some children. But, uh, but he spent the most of his life um, just simply seeking after wisdom. And he kind of exemplified that. Um, another major teaching of Socrates, and, and this relates to the care for the soul, is that the unexamined life is not worth living. The unexamined life is not worth living. Now, Socrates believed that people typically, just on average, they're born into this world, they're raised in the homes of their parents, and they more or less adopt the same kind of values that their parents adopt. And they more or less reflect the same kind of values that the the society around them reflects. And he, he believes that to go through life Simply accepting the values and the truths and the the priorities of other people, whether it be people that are close to you and that you love, or whether it be just your society and culture at large, to to accept those out of hand without critiquing them, without evaluating them, um, that would be that 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 life is not worth living. You're living someone else's life at that point. You're living someone else's values. You're 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 trying to exemplify someone else's virtues and this this kind of thing. What what we need to do is uh, before we do something, we need to ask ourselves: Is this something that? Uh, that, that will benefit me, that will care for my soul, that will develop me as a person. Um, and uh, he, so he, he talks much about that. Um, and and uh, the quote is actually from him that the, the unexamined life is not worth living. We need to examine our assumptions. We need to examine our values. We need to examine our priorities and make sure that those things are conducive to developing and improving the soul. So that, that, that's a, another major teaching of Socrates. Um, and one last one that also is related to these first two is, is, is this. It's basically that a good person cannot be harmed by another. A good person cannot be harmed by another. Now, we might think of that and just sort of at first glance, that seems to be not true, right? Because bad people harm people all the time. But remember, Socrates makes this distinction between the body and the soul. And if a person is going, a bad person, if say they come up and they assault you or something, they may have the ability to harm your body. But remember, that's not really, that's not an issue. Because the body is made of matter, matter is going to pass away, matter, the, the soul will be one day released. And so even though a person, a bad person, evil person, might come and harm you, even to the point where you die, ultimately, that's not actually harming you. The only way that anything can actually harm you is to harm your soul. And the only person that can, that can harm your soul is you. 
Uh, you're the only one who can allow uh, things to affect you to the degree that it corrupts your soul and harms your soul. So that's, why he, that's what he's saying by a good person cannot be harmed by another. And we see this teaching played out as Socrates. Um, he is given the death penalty, actually. for, uh, for he's, he's, he's been given the charge of corrupting the youth and the charge of impiety toward the gods. And uh, he, is, he is given the death penalty. <clears throat> and um, on the eve of his execution, where he will be required to drink hemlock uh, poison uh, and, and, and thus die, uh, his followers, who have been basically by his side the whole time he's in jail awaiting execution, his followers are, are, have bribed the guard. And they tell him, look, Socrates, we have arranged to take and get you out of the city. We can get you out of the city and, and maybe take you over to Athens or Corinth or someplace like that. But we can get you out of here so that you can be safe and you don't have to suffer this penalty of execution. And Socrates looks at him and he kind of shakes his head. He's like, you know what, guys? Uh, I thought you understood what I was talking about. He says, I appreciate that you wanted to keep me alive, but here's the deal. And this is my, I guess, translation of it. He says, here's the deal. If I, uh, you know, what they, what they have done to me is unjust. What Athens has done to me is, is wrong. But I have lived my whole entire life in Athens. And during that whole time, the laws of this city have protected me. The laws of uh, Athens have allowed me to go and, and do philosophy uh, all this time and to teach people and to spread my, my love for wisdom and my love, my curiosity about the world, to spread that everywhere. The laws have allowed me to do that. And he says, how could I, here at the end of my life, how could I even think about going in violating the laws, defying the laws of Athens, which for so many years has done me so good, so much good? How could I even think about doing that? Because if I did that, I would be corrupting my soul. I would be saying to the law, the law is good so long as it's benefiting me, but once it's finished benefiting me, then I, I, I can disregard it. You know, if everybody did that, that would destroy Athens. That would, that would destroy the system of laws. And so for me to do this and endorse doing this just to save my own life, that would be a terrible deed in, in, indeed. So he believed that doing such a thing would actually lead to cor a corruption in his soul. And as such, Socrates says, no, I, I will drink the hemlock. I will go ahead and die even though it kills me uh, so, that, so that I can protect my soul. Because as soon as I do die, Know that what happens to me is my soul is going to be shed of this body. The body is going to go away. It's going to decompose. My soul will be free then to continue on this quest that I have begun in this life so that, uh, and, and to do so without the, without the pull of physical appetites, things like hunger and sleep and the drive for sexuality and, and all of these physical distractions. He says, my soul won't have those anymore. And I'll be able to continue the development of the soul, the care for my soul and growing in wisdom and in knowledge uh, even after I die. And so that was, that was Socrates' big, um, that, that was the end of his life. That was the statement that he made. And certainly he was consistent with what he believed that a good person cannot be harmed by another. And he refused to harm his own soul, even though it might save his, his life. Uh, so, but that was, that was Socrates. Much more could be said, so do make sure that you do the reading. There's plenty of more good material in there. Uh, do the reading and finish the rest of the work for this section. And uh, we will see you uh, in the next video.